think where I want to start this My panel is with a statement that former Speaker Gingrich made, which is, we have no payment models that are innovation encouraging models. Um, and the purpose of this panel is to think about um, how do current payment systems and benefit designs impact biomedical innovation? And we've asked them to talk about what reforms would promote innovation and economic value. Uh, each of you uh, have five minutes uh, uh, of prepared thoughts. Uh, and after that, I hope we'll discuss it as a group. So let me briefly introduce the presenters. Uh, Dr. Jerry Avorn is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and chief of the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb is resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and also a practicing physician. Dr. Frieda Lewis Hall is chief medical officer at Pfizer and member of the Board of Governors for the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, and Dr. Rob Epstein is president of Advanced Clinical Science and Research and Chief Clinical Research and Development Officer at Medco Health Solutions. Uh, Jerry, you've studied trends in innovation and innovation uh, for a long time. Maybe you could start. Sure, happy to, and thanks for having me. Um, I guess I can begin in the spirit of, of Passover and asking why should the healthcare se sector be different from all the other sectors of the economy? <laughs> uh, that, that we don't really hear um, the electronics industry, which is another interesting science-driven, innovation-laden uh, part of the, of the economy, uh, which has brought us enormous improvements over the last 20, 30 years in quality with plummeting prices for all of you who've recently bought an iPhone. Um, the products keep getting better and cheaper, and we don't hear Steve Jobs um, going public and whining that the market is impairing his ability to innovate. So why are our two fields, which have so much in common, uh, behaving so differently? Um, is it possible to take the question that has been put before us for the reimbursement system in healthcare to stifle innovation? And I would answer yes, it is. Uh, look around at what we have today before any reforms have really kicked in. We have a reimbursement system that already is stifling innovation, but maybe not in the way that, that some might think I mean. Uh, that we currently have an untamed loosey-goosey system that is um, doing that right now. Um, for example, one interesting case study is the purple pill that everybody who watches the evening news knows all about. It started out as omeprazole, which is a breakthrough proton pump inhibitor. And as the patent on it began to expire, the patent was extended around a variety of uh, not so clinically relevant issues like the coating and, and other peripheral aspects of the pill. And then when it ultimately, after many years of extension, uh, was expired, the manufacturer switched the mantle of the purple pill to a new drug, which was simply the S isomer of the first drug, which was pharmacologically pretty much identical, and then marketed the hell out of it and did very well financially with Nexium instead of Prilosec. And I would argue that that's an example of the way in which our current reimbursement system rewards non-innovation. It was a very lucrative deal for AstraZeneca, but it did not really bring about any improvement for patients, although the cost was, was really pretty um, impressive. Um, and let me be clear, this is not just about drugs. The same issues apply to many other things we do in healthcare, including what we physicians do, imaging studies, devices. We all have the same problem, which is that the current system will pay for pretty much anything without a lot of ability to discriminate between really breakthrough um, products or services and those which are kind of ho-hum, maybe not even necessary, and maybe even hurtful. Another example uh, is citalopram, uh, which was morphed into Lexapro by, again, looking at the isomer. Same drug, and it now is the most uh, widely selling and costly antidepressant in the country. Uh, this is not about uh, an FDA problem. If you, if you look at the fact that the productivity of the um, pharmaceutical industry uh, has been really pretty lame, and I think even folks on Wall Street uh, and within the industry will admit this after a couple of beers, uh, that 18 to 20 new molecular entities per year is not what we've seen in the past. Add a couple of biologics in, it's still not what we would expect from the dozens of billions of dollars that go in uh, to it. And it's not that FDA is taking too long or being too tough. The inputs into the FDA system are lame as well. So is the argument that we need our current really costly, inefficient healthcare system um, to be working at its current uh, pace of inefficiency in order to have the excess dollars 
that we need for innovation? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's a wasteful way to, to accomplish innovation. Um, and in a sense, the uh, uh, speaker mentioned that uh, if we give money to universities for research, they go and spend it on deans. Well, my worry is that if we give money to uh, pharmaceutical companies or device makers and ask them to spend it on research, so they go spending it on marketing. The same kind of issues apply. We're only seeing about 15 or 20 percent of every dollar of revenue in pharma in the big companies going back to R&D, whereas NIH, the number is much closer to 90 plus percent. If you ask any investor, where would you rather put your money to get innovation, I don't know that they would want to put it more in, in the private sector, even though the narrative that we all live with is that that's where all the innovation comes from. Um, much of the alternative transformative new science really, I think, would argue is coming from, from industry and uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, from, from academia, funded often by taxpayer dollars. And we have a rather funny way that we arrange the patent law so that very little of that flows back to, uh, to the folks who are really doing the transformative studies. Let me end with some positive uh, recommendations. Um, I think all of us in, in healthcare need, need more focused incentives to really innovate and not just do Me Too products that we can make a bundle of money on, or for us physicians, keep doing procedures that patients may or may not need, or for the academic medical centers of which I work in one, um, keep doing very expensive tertiary care when in fact a lot more low tech care would work just as well. We need an era of tough love in which the reimbursement system is much more um, responsive to the realities of comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness. And to get there, we need the following. We need to do the comparative effectiveness study so that a payor or an academic medical center or a patient um, is going to be able to dis distinguish between things that are overpriced and not real helpful uh, versus those things that are a good buy. And that is only going to come through systematic research, which in my view needs to be publicly funded because we're not going to see that kind of research coming from the creators of these products, whether it is um, academic medical centers, device makers, doctors, or drug companies. We want to pay more for smart, cost-effective care, and we want to pay less for things that are not as good and not as cost-effective. And we therefore need to, A, know the difference, which we cannot do with FDA's current approval of, is it better than placebo in, a, in achieving a, a surrogate outcome? That doesn't give us what we need to do. But PCORI, if it lives, will help us get that information. And then we need to push it out to the doctors. The other big gap we have is in getting physicians to actually have access to that information. And over the years, we've been working on this thing called academic detailing, where we send folks out from a university base to, in a sense, sell evidence-based medicine. And that seems to be a way of getting the effector arm of that last translational hurdle so that you can really transform care. Um, we are already spending the money, and this is the last point I want to make. The idea that we are somehow running out of money in healthcare is, does not bear the scrutiny of comparing us to other countries in the world, which, as I trust everyone here knows, are spending less per capita on healthcare, covering everybody, and getting better outcomes. So it is not as if somehow there is some magic formula that no one can, can yet figure out. We just need to understand what those countries are doing. Mostly what they're doing is not having everything in medicine be entrepreneurial focused so that it's all about maximizing revenue. There is some vision of, of, of a public health concept for healthcare. And we can go them one better by being the leaders in the world in comparative effectiveness studies while leaving room for the occasional outlier patient who is not like everybody else, doesn't fit the algorithm. And we absolutely have to leave room for that. Um, or we can go on and, and kind of be bullied that we are, we are destroying innovation and, and uh, sending research overseas. Um, I can't help but comment that a lot of the reasons that regenerative medicine is thriving overseas is that one of the parties currently in office uh, shut down stem cell research for a lot of years, and a lot of companies were forced to go overseas. But be that as it may, if we go on in our current pathway, I'm not the right person to ask what would happen. I think the right people to ask about that course of action of continuing without change would probably be Standard & Poor's or the Central Bank of China. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I guess I'll re-ask about reimbursement policy of our next speaker. <laughs> Scott? I, I think the question is how, how do we come up with a reimbursement system that sends the proper signals to entrepreneurs to try to drive innovation that not just lowers costs but also improves outcomes, not just in the short run, but in the long run as well, which is harder to measure in a reimbursement system. It also reduces morbidity, because after all, an innovation might not improve outcomes, but it could, Im could improve um, the patient experience, which is, could be a significant uh, advantage. I think the operative place to look to, to, 
ask this question is medical devices and not necessarily drugs. I think that for a number of reasons. Number one, I think when you look at medical devices, you see um, more clearly the impact, the corrosive impact that the reimbursement system has had on innovation, uh, much more clearly than you see it in the drug realm. And number two, the, the bottom line is we just don't spend a lot on drugs relative to our total healthcare budget. I know the bill for biologics is growing um, quickly, but when you look at what we spend on drugs, about 10% of our $3 trillion that we spend overall, so about $300 billion. You've got almost 80% generic utilization uh, already. You're not going to drive that much higher. Uh, and when you compare it to other places where we spend money in the healthcare system, we spend 6% of our money on uh, ancillary services like PT and, uh, and optometry. I'm not saying we shouldn't be spending money on that. We spend about 5% on uh, dental care, so we could literally adopt the UK approach to dental care rather than the pro approach to drug pricing and cut our drug bill in half. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of places when you look at the uh, total expenditures of drugs relative to other things, it's just not that big of a bucket. So most of the spending is actually um, in what physicians do, and that's driven by technology with um, respect to medical devices, new, uh, new procedures, new devices. And so when you look at how folks who are thinking of innovating a medical device now think about getting reimbursement, I would categorize it in three big buckets. Um, the first thing is and you, what you're doing when you're developing new medical devices, you're trying to develop a device that fits into a current code or a current reimbursement line um, as articulated by Medicare. And the problem with the coding structure of, of Medicare is it defines mo mo most of what happens in the private sector. So there's three big buckets I would say that innovators look at. One is they try to drive up doctor revenue, so they try to develop a new device that's going to um, create incentives for doctors to use a device because doctors can increase their revenue. So it might be um, doing more procedures or a new kind of procedure, doing a procedure earlier, or allowing a physician to do a procedure that used to take three or four hours in one hour so they can do more procedures in a day. Um, the second big bucket is um, trying to uh, improve patient outcomes. And when you're trying to develop a device that improves patient outcomes or lowers morbidity um, or is more, a more comfortable approach to a procedure, that's heavily dependent on direct-to-consumer advertising. You're often speaking to the patient um, because in many cases you're displacing current, uh, current paradigms in medicine. A uh, classic example is the approach, minimally invasive approach to uterine fibroids. Rather than doing a hysterectomy, you use a, a minimally invasive approach um, to ablating fibroids. That required referral away from the gynecologists, who were the ones who held on to these patients, and so the company had to go directly to consumers. Um, and the third bucket is a medical device that tries to lower costs. And in that case, you're often making your pitch to a hospital or a GPO or some other purchasing system um, to try to say that my new medical innovation is going to lower costs. But in all of these schemes, what you're trying to do is develop a device that fits within a current um, reimbursement code, a current code as it exists in Medicare. And it's an extremely inefficient system. If you're talking about a system that sends signals to entrepreneurs to just try to de develop devices, um, that improve long-term outcomes, lower costs, um, reduce morbidity, you can see how the current system forces you into one of these sort of preordained um, categories or preordained buckets. And so what, what kind of reimbursement system do I think would be optimal? It's a very hard question. Obviously, it's going to be a subject of a lot of debate here in Washington. I don't think we have an answer. But certainly a system um, where the purchaser, um, ideally it would be the patient, but it's not the patient because we have third-party payers for health care, but where the purchaser have a, has a long-term perspective. Um, you're not just trying to tie reimbursement to short-term measures of outcomes, but whoever is making the decision to purchase the technology or finance it holds on to the patient or is held accountable for the long-term durable outcomes uh, of the patient. Uh, we have some sort of experimentation of models that approximate that. I think Medicare Advantage, to a degree, did that. Medicare Advantage plans had an incentive to hold on to patients. Um, the churn was very expensive to them. Um, they were penalized for a lot of turnover, so they had an incentive to get patients in the door, keep them, improve their outcome, lower the costs of their care. Uh, I think some of the experimentation that's going on in Massachusetts with the shared savings models, where the payers are entering into long-term contracts with the provider communities, um, that has elements of the same, um, same thing incorporated into it. Uh, but the bottom line is the scheme we have right now, particularly as it relates to medical devices, which I think is the operative piece of biomedical innovation where we're going to see a lot of the cost, um, cost being driven in the future because it's so closely tied to what physicians do, and that's where the real costs are. Uh, the current scheme we have right now doesn't uh, send signals to innovators to try to develop products that necessarily improve outcomes, lower costs. It sends signals to innovators to develop products that fit within one of the paradigms, one of the reimbursement codes that's preordained by Medicare and sort of fixed in time. Thank you. Uh, Frida and Rob, you're on the front lines of 
uh, these reimbursement questions from both sides. So, uh, Frida, perhaps you could start and talk about this. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to make the comment that um, I, I think we are all in agreement that the productivity that is coming out from an innovative standpoint at this point is, um, is stalled um, <laughs> at best. If you look at um, approvals over the last, well, since I was born, um, has <laughs> remained around the same, and um, that was not yesterday. So um, we know that we're stalled in our advance, and it's such a shame because um, science is certainly turning corners that we could potentially apply. And the question is, what will we need to do to turbocharge and to harness this cognitive surplus and the technology advancements to the advantage of innovation for everyone? Um, you know, there are lots of ways in which to do that. Certainly, uh, focus um, is one, and a new affiliative model, if you would, um, is, is another, and by that briefly I mean that, um, you know, previously innovation has been an invented here, I mean inherently an invented here model. And I think that we are going to have to get to a not invented here model where it's a much more collaborative and affiliative model for sharing expertise, sharing data, um, and then applying that to um, best outcomes. To transition into then what would a reimbursement um, a platform look like that would further stimulate that, um, it's really the same thing that stimulates innovation in the first place, which is um, knowing, um, knowing outcomes. And there's a data dearth, if you would, on what innovations applied actually mean in terms of outcomes and how you take all of the variables that occur in the course of providing patient care to get to the right outcome. So is it the device or is it its application? Is it the new uh, treatment, the new biologic, or is it the way in which it is incorporated into the health system and applied to the best outcome? And last but certainly not least is the definitional aspect of what is a good outcome at all. And I'm not sure that we're necessarily agreed on that in the first place. Um, and therefore, what we would consider value. In preparation for this, I laughed and said, um, if uh, the treatment of my foot were in a value-based platform, then I pity the fool that um, was uh, responsible for evaluating what that value was. I was the worst and least compliant patient ever. And so I'm not sure what uh, the best efforts of the devices, the uh, medications, and the other innovations that were brought to bear on this would actually have borne for me at the end of the day because I just couldn't get with the program. So, you know, there are all kinds of environmental variables from a system standpoint, from a patient standpoint, and from a definitional standpoint that could potentially stand in the way of developing a system that honestly values value um, in a correct way. So what will we do about that? Evidence, evidence, evidence. Um, at the end of the day, I think probably three things in big buckets. The first is providing a data generation analysis um, and communication system that allows us to agree on a lexicon, on nosology, on data standards, and on outcome standards so that we're all speaking the same language. Um, and then um, to have an infrastructure that allows us to quickly, uh, if not in real time, collect data, analyze it against these uh, standards and within the context of these definitions, and to be able to draw some important conclusions. So the uh, data standards, the infrastructure, and then uh, last but not least, that system to provide some flexibility and um, some context. There's some things that are easy to put in that paradigm. A disease-modifying treatment for cystic fibrosis um, would certainly be easier to analyze on the obvious adding value end versus uh, evolved treatments for um, chronic diseases for which we do not have a good agreed upon standards at this point. So, um, you know, adding together the data itself and some agreed definitions and analytics around those, the uh, a platform for sharing those and very quickly analyzing them from an infrastructure standpoint. And then last but not least, some flexibility in the system and a broadness to apply all of the things that we would need to analyze in order to actually communicate at the end of the day to Frida that she could get her best outcomes by doing the following things and that that conversation uh, can be had and then uh, reimbursed for. Thank you. Rob? Uh, thank you. Thanks for being on the panel. It's a thrill for me to be here, although following Frida is always a tough act. So <laughs> glad to be here with you today, Frida. 
I'm also glad to be the token representative of the payer community on today's <laughs> panel. Um, and um, I just want to make a few background statements and then um, provide a few um, insights or thoughts. By way of background, I'd say it's absolutely true, as Jerry pointed out, that five to 10 years ago, uh, the payer community would look at a drug that's the flipped enantiomer or two pills glued together <laughs> or a once a day going to once a week or adding some inert ingredient to a device would all be considered innovations and therefore be reimbursed. Just willy-nilly, that was the case. Uh, but I don't think that's the case today. Today, it's really more of the show me the comparative money. So I, I inserted the word comparative because it's not just show me the money, but it's compared to usual care, as Frida pointed out, or the comparative outcomes. Um, I was at a meeting with a um, scientist-based biopharma company recently. We we're talking about their product and how they viewed it was a real breakthrough innovation. And I was pointing out, well, there's you know these three other molecules coming along too, and they said, well, that's an inelegant molecule. Why would anyone pay for that? And I thought, well, I don't think people go to the shopping mall to look how pretty the molecules are. When they select a drug, it's really around the outcome. But the scientist actually thought that the way it was constructed was inelegant, and therefore nobody would purchase. So we have some room to go um, to bridge the gap between the science community and the payer community, because that one blew my mind. Um, I will say that innovations, in, in contrast to one of the earlier talks, uh, innovations that have the capability of bending the cost curve are very interesting to the payer community. So the payers actually find regenerative medicine, nanotechnology, and stem cell research fascinating and it, really exciting uh, science, particularly because they have the opportunity to cure things and not just convert things into chronic maintenance drug therapy conditions. So uh, by contrast to what was said earlier, I can tell you that the payer community is actually very interested in those new sciences. Of course, let's wait and see what they actually produce. Um, anyway, to get to a couple of points then that I would make about um, uh, how to kind of use the payer system to be an accelerator for innovation. Uh, firstly, I would say um, it's really important to engage payers earlier, uh, earlier than like five minutes before a product launches. My observation has been that the biopharmaceutical community in the past, you know, really in, and until very recently, only in some companies' cases, would come to the payer community with a uh, with the cake in the oven already being baked, and say, you know, I've got this product coming, you know, maybe six months or a year from now. You're going to love the taste of it. We're baking this cake, and the payer community would, you know, we'd scratch our heads and go, but that's a placebo-controlled trial. How does it do against, you know, we don't we don't pay for placebo. We pay for this other drug, and you know, where's the hospitalization or the ER visit data? And did you think of this or that? And they're like. No, 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 the cake's in the oven. You're going to love this. So um, my thought about that is that there is this notion around mandatory end of phase two meetings that the biopharma companies come down to the FDA always, always, always at the end of phase two and say, look, this is the cake we're going to bake in phase three. FDA, what do you think? If we bake it according to this way, will you, and it works, will you approve this drug? And, you know, that's the negotiation that always happens at the end of phase two. There is no like similar kind of a conversation with the payer community. I think there should be. I think it would be fantastic because then when the cake gets baked, it can hit both the regulatory but also the reimbursement system. I think it's a real accelerator for innovation. Second thought there is that research, uh, the payers can actually be collaborators. And you're probably thinking, how is that possible? Um, about six years ago, we were interested in genomic science and trying to figure out, well, gee, how can we adapt or adopt this for the payer community and what's missing. And what was missing was understanding with or without the use of a genetic test, would it reduce hospitalizations and actually have a return on investment for paying for the test? So we turned to our payer community and 29 payers raised their hands and said, we'd like to collaborate with you on the design and the conduct of the study, which they did do. Um, we completed the study. It provided the evidence that they felt comfortable with. And today we have over 300 payers paying for that technology based on being collaborators, both in the design and the conduct of the study. Something a little different. Uh, one last thought um, that I would like to just throw in is that I didn't hear anywhere in today's discussion uh, funding or research into translational studies, translating things from the bench to the bedside. We, we really need that badly. Um, we under, you know, it's great to fund all new you know, genome-wide association studies to find something new that's exciting. Uh, or to um, develop something w which shows that you can move a surrogate outcome measure. But how does all that translate in the real world where people don't live uh, in academic medical centers and don't get themselves treated according to that standard of care? Uh, how will that translate? Because that's the world in which the payer is paying. 
Um, one quick last anecdote there. The most monumentally important study in the world of cholesterol was conducted and completed in the mid-90s, which showed that lowering cholesterol reduces all-cause mortality. Prior to that, the epidemiologic studies had shown a reduction, but an increase in homicides and suicides for people with the lowest cholesterol, which I know if you take French fries away from me, that's definitely true. <laughs> so uh, interestingly, though, this randomized trial, the first one ever completed, showed a 30% drop in all-cause mortality, published in The Lancet in the mid-'90s. But if you look at the method section, 92% of patients at the end of 5.2 years were still on therapy, and were still on placebo at 5.2 years. In the real world, 50% of people drop off their therapy in the first year. 25% might make it to five years. So that translation of what you might want to believe you see in the RCT environment doesn't always translate into the real world. Now, you can blame the system. You can blame the patient. You can blame the doc. You can blame everybody. But it is what it is. That's what the payers are paying for. So I would uh, like just to put forth that we, we need more funding and research in the, the world of real world uh, studies, including translational studies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> so, Jerry, you spoke about CER and comparative trials. Uh, Scott, you spoke about demonstrations that promote value. Uh, Frida, you emphasized measuring and promoting outcomes. And Rob, you emphasized bending the cost curve, reducing hospitalizations as ways as criteria for reimbursement. I think if I, it's always hazardous for me to try to unify a theme, but. <laughs> what we're really talking about here is moving from a model where we pay for health care to paying for health. And that's a fundamental change. Um, and if you think about it, I think HIV, which uh, the former spe speaker Gingrich raised, is a very good example. When uh, prior to the introduction of highly active antiretroviral therapy in the mid-90s, uh, HIV was relatively inexpensive to treat. But if you asked, what is the price of health? That is, what, how much would I have to pay to get to improve my mortality chances? The price was actually infinite, even though the total expenditures were low. That is, no matter how much money you had, no matter how wealthy you had, you couldn't buy any health. And with the introduction of heart, of course, we lowered that price because we took HIV and we moved it to uh, a death sentence to becoming a manageable chronic illness in many ways. And so the price came down, but of course there was a lot of alarm about the price of these drugs because these dry drugs were uh, in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, now with the introduction of generics, of course, we've been able to lower the price. So if you think about it as health economists would, we went from a disease where the price was infinite to where the price was um, about ten uh, to twenty thousand dollars in those current dollars, uh, but from a policy perspective, people viewed it as going from a price of zero to raising the price substantially. And so, we need to think better about how we're going to reimburse uh, f on the basis of these health improvements. And the data now show that the introduction of heart has generated uh, about a trillion dollars in surplus, which to society, which is uh, the number that I think uh, the former speaker mentioned. So uh, I think that's a good, if it, would any of you like to comment on that? Well, there's sometimes a tendency for people to think that innovation is going to be cost saving. And hardly anything uh, in healthcare is really cost saving. Uh, maybe aspirin for secondary prevention in high risk patients of heart disease, maybe some kidney vaccines, but everything else is in the realm that you're describing of is it a good buy or a bad buy, but it's always going to um, add to what we spend. And that's okay, that's a good thing. It's, it's when we begin to expect that it's gonna drive costs down that we are in the realm of the probably not. And we just need to accept that and say that's an okay thing for a society to be spending money on. I would, I would just, the only comment I'd make uh, and the points you know, well taken is that costs that get absorbed into the provider community often not very transparent. There was a very heavy cost to um, the treatment of patients with AIDS in the absence of heart. It just was distributed across the provider community in the form of intensive care unit stays and other kinds of very expensive procedures um, as opposed to the drugs which was easily measurable. And so the offsetting costs that I think sometimes the pharmacotherapy achieves uh, aren't readily recognized because they're, they diffuse into the healthcare system, if you will, in the form of more procedures, more morbidity, more doctor visits, et cetera. 
Right, and the evidence shows that there were re reduced hospitalizations, which I think would help meet the criterion that you laid out, Rob. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have time for, who's keeping us on track? I don't know. <laughs> we have I think we have time for questions, so we'll open it up to the audience. Stun them into silence. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then I get, to, I get to ask some more questions then. So, uh, Frida, maybe you could talk about, uh, Jerry raised the issue of comparative effectiveness, and uh, there are some concerns about comparative effectiveness. How will it, it treat populations, for instance, that are in the minority in terms of how they respond to therapy uh, and such? And maybe you could talk a little bit about um, your, the industry's view on CER, we won't hold you to it for the entire industry, but maybe your personal views on CER. Well, I, I actually believe, and I think that it's a widely held um, or agreed to belief, that good clinical comparative effectiveness is a really important piece of what we do on a day-to-day -day, um, day -day basis and should be continued, enhanced, and grown. Um, we, we, there are several... Um, kind of a necessary to-dos in comparative effectiveness. First, a pill-on-pill, -pill, a device-on-device -device, um, comparison is not necessarily um, an effective way to do a comparison. And I think that uh, we've become much more sophisticated in understanding the complexity of our system, uh, the system into which this, these new innovations go and how they should be uh, compared in terms of the outcomes that are produced. So if that's what we mean by comparative effectiveness, I, you know, I think that, um, again, this is an area that we've all agreed is important. The question is, how are you then going to apply it? What are you going to focus on as endpoints? How will they be agreed? What are the data standards? Some of the things that I had mentioned before um, as the important paradigms for, uh, or the important paradigm for shaping the way comparative effectiveness moves forward. And the second thing um, that I think is really important and uh, um, maybe Rob would like to con um, comment on this as well, is the way in which we really throw a broad net, not just comparing uh, whether or not um, everything from wait, um, waitful uh, watching to an aggressive intervention has an impact on the outcome of a patient, but what new novel ways we can apply to um, phenotypically or genotypically using biomarkers and advanced science start to cull out populations that would be better responders, for example, to a certain therapy over another therapy or group of therapies, and then um, who might be a non-responder or who might be um, more likely to have an adverse event, therefore reducing a risk benefit for, for a treatment. So the idea that we have some science available to us to apply um, to go from all diabetics to this subpopulation of diabetics or everyone with non-small cell lung cancer to a certain population of uh, patients with non-small cell lung cancer becomes something that if we could find a way to clinically apply this in a meaningful way would not just mean something for um, us in the healthcare provision fields, but will mean something to patients in terms of improving their outcomes. So I think it's a go. We have a question here. Can we get a microphone? And if you could introduce yourself before you ask. Ann Bonham, Association of American Medical Colleges. I think Rob made a very good point about the opportunity lost from not funding translation uh, into widespread communities, whether it's subgroups identified by Frida or not. But right now, there's no actual funding from federal funding agencies, or as far as we can tell from payers, to think about dissemination science or the implementation and getting out to the broad swath of communities. And I was wondering if you could uh, comment on that or you know, give money for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, that's a great point, though. You're right. We need to have some sort of, I believe, government subsidy of this kind of research. But the private community is, is self-funding these studies. So for example, um, years ago, we were looking at this issue about co-pays and does going too far with copay have unintended consequences. And we actually published our paper in the New England Journal uh, where we found that if you went too far with copay increases, people would drop off their therapy. Um, and we used that information to inform the payer community, be careful. You know, there are these unintended consequences of doing something like that. 
So um, I would agree with you. We absolutely have to have uh, a funding, me a federal funding mechanism for translational studies. It's not enough for, you know, individual payers to try to scrimp together a little bit of money to look at a question that a, you know somebody's asking them. We need to have a whole agenda and priority setting, and, and it's a shame we don't have it because those are the questions that are really, I think, uh, decelerating innovation, not accelerating it. We can accelerate innovation if we just learn more about how to translate things uh, or what the barriers are for adoption. One quick point on that, which I think is um, interesting, just at least to me. It's all about me at the moment. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> In the area of personalized medicine, we collaborated with the American Medical Association to do a physician survey just to see attitudes and awareness. And what we found was that 98% of physicians responded that they get the point that genes relate to drugs. You know, like there's something in genetics that might have something to do with the way you respond or have a safety problem. But two thirds of physicians don't remember ever having a course in genetics. Only 12% have ordered a test in the last six months. So. Talk about translation. We could spend billions of dollars deciphering all sorts of ahas from the genomic world uh, through the NIH and other mechanisms. But if we can't get to the next hurdle, which is translating that to an audience who doesn't know how to even receive that, we're not going to get this out to the bedside. So I'm, I'm a big supporter. I think we should be creative and think of new ways to do it. And I'm, we're open for collaboration, not funding all of it, but, <laughs> but perhaps being a way to get it distributed. Okay, we have time for one question. It's reserved for uh, Sean, but I'm going to ask a question while you're giving him the microphone, which is, what responsibility do payers uh, have? You, Rob, you mentioned the example of an elegant molecule. Um, <laughs> Speaker Gingrich was talking about Alzheimer's, uh, which is a social epidemic, uh, the magnitude of which we haven't seen in this country. Treatments are limited, but what responsibilities do Medicare and payers have to reward marginal innovation, but yet they may lead to something further down the road that's going to solve this? Uh, Scott, maybe you could talk about this in the context of Medicare. Uh, you know, there's been constructs created in the past to try to create technology pass-through payments, and Sean knows far more about this than I do. I don't think any of them have worked very well. I think Medicare does have a responsibility um, as a government payer and also as a payer that is no, what we used to say is no ordinary payer. It drives the rest of the market. And so I think the agency needs to be, um, needs to think about these issues, needs to be generous in how it reimburses things with the idea in mind that it could, um, could choke off innovation because it's such a big um, weight in the marketplace. But I don't think they have any capacity to contemplate these kinds of issues right now. They just don't have in-house the mechanisms, the expertise to really think about these kinds of issues. And so that's why you get this sort of price schedule payment approach trying to fit new innovations into pre-existing codes. Um, and then you get all kinds of gaming in the innovative sector that I don't think is necessarily sending the right signals to entrepreneurs. If I can, if I can just add, add briefly yeah. onto that, that, that payers, whether it's Medicare or the private sector, need to get better at this gray zone of new technologies that may pan out and may not. And um, certainly when Mark was running CMS, this notion developed um, a very good one of coverage with evidence development, that this, this kind of passageway from this doesn't work, we're not going to pay for it, to everybody should have access to this. And it's a terribly powerful and useful way of trying to learn things about how well things work. And that needs to be built into the payer mechanism, whoever the payer is. Let me just jump in, too, in the context of rare diseases. So there are 4,500 rare diseases that 20 million Americans suffer from. And I will tell you, even a margin, you asked the question, marginal innovation, any marginal innovation in any of those diseases would be met with enthusiasm by the payer community. Mm -hmm. And they would help foster the development of bigger innovations. Because those are diseases where there's just nothing. Talk about unmet need, like nothing. Right. So there's no one going to begrudge. There's no payer will begrudge even a marginal innovation to help those types of folks. We need more of that. We need more unmet needs to be addressed, not the met needs. And I I know we have. <laughs> I just really want to uh, say a word about incremental innovation. And I know things like fixed dose combinations don't seem, you know, seem like low level innovation. <laughs> but as a, you know, as a practicing psychiatrist, I can tell you that, com you know, fixed dose combinations that advanced um, adherence for patients, for example, um, were important yeah. in the context of patient outcomes. So despite the fact that they're inelegant in um, many ways, they're elegant for patient outcomes. And I, I just want to make sure that we don't minimize the impact of 
what appear to be marginal um, or incremental advancements in terms of their potential impact on patient outcomes. And, and not, al not always easy to develop at a scientific level. It took two it's years exactly to develop right. Truvada because of the formulation. I, I was with you until you said potential. I think the argument is <laughs> no, no, oh, that's got demonstrated. Be demonstrate. Thank you. Oh, the yeah, the best the example of that, of course, is HIV, where you went from 23 pill a day regimens to one a day and allowed you to treat HIV in Africa. Um, Sean, if you could, you had a question and yeah. we'll. Uh, Sean Tunis from the Center for Medical Technology Policy. It's actually on the same point of, you know, incremental or marginal innovation, whatever you want to call it. I guess it's mainly for Frida. Um, also for Scott, just because I like to hear Scott talk because usually I disagree with him, but he makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to puzzle my way through that. But I, I agree is, with half of that. <laughs> <laughs> so... Jerry raised the, the example of the, uh, you know, the purple pill, the L or S enantiomer of uh, omeprazole. And, you know, I think the, you know, a certain, you know, the kind of the implication, or maybe you actually said it was, you know, in that kind of context where there's essentially, you know, one could argue whether there's any incremental benefit that, you know, the, the reimbursement system should not differentially reward that in terms of pricing compared to, in this case, it would be the generic. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, my question, uh, you know, what I've also heard, though, is that that incremental pricing is required in order to sort of, you know, fund uh, or, or create the potential awards that actually then promote investment in sort of innovation. And so you can't have a sort of a, you know, a value-based price that's linked to, you know, incremental improvement. And I guess so I'm interested in how both of you think about this whole notion of, you know, a you know, essentially a reference pricing approach versus a value-based pricing approach and how that would actually I impact on innovation. And, and I'll just say, we're interested in your answer, but briefly. So I'll let, let, <laughs> let's let Scott go since we know at least the formula for your response to him, and then I'll... <laughs> just because we're out of time. But. Well, I, John, I agree, I agree with you on the notion of, of a payer being able to titrate reimbursement and, and moving away from this sort of binary approach to reimbursement. Being able to do things like what you know covered with evidence development, which we did when you were there, um, or other kinds of schemes like that. I think right now what we have, at least with Medicare, is a very binary approach to reimbursement, where in some contexts everything gets paid for, like you know orphan drugs, they all get covered no matter what. Um, and in other contexts, like diagnostic tests, nothing gets paid for, almost nothing gets paid for. Um, so you know that agency, I don't think, is incorporating any kind of valuation of. Uh, innovation or, or where there's, you know, incremental rewards to patients into how it's paying for things. It's sort of a, a, a fixed process where there's different buckets and sometimes you pay for everything and sometimes you pay for nothing. I, you know, if there's other constructs in which you can titrate the level of the reimbursement and provide pathways for things to get onto the market, get guaranteed reimbursement, um, have a period of time to continue to demonstrate incremental improvements, I think those make sense. I don't think right now Medicare has the capacity to do that measurement and that's the difficulty. I think it's going to be very hard to build that into the system. Um, last word. I, yep. Oh, the last word, my favorite. Um, I, no, I think that everybody is focused on in, um, bringing innovation to the market that improve pa improves patients' outcomes. And I think we've struggled with the ability to demonstrate that and to have that demonstration accepted by the payers at the other end. So I want to underscore some of the things in terms of reimbursement that, that um, Rob uh, suggested, which is um, earlier understanding of what would constitute value to patients' outcomes, um, how big that value has to be, what the appropriate endpoints are, how it would be measured in a meaningful way during um, a randomized clinical trial versus how we would evolve that information base or that databases or evidence base for that when it got out into the marketplace and more patients were exposed. So um, earlier and better understanding of what the value add would be, how it would be measured, and then um, a collaborative real world platform for us with um, at the end of the day how these things were gonna be applied and to design that early enough in the course of uh, drug development so that we were um, ready to hit the ro road running and that we didn't have years and years uh, where it wasn't necessary to see a longer term outcome before we ever got any meaningful data on how we had made an impact on, um, on patients at the end of the day. Great, and I think we'll hear more about measurement uh, in the third panel today. So I want to thank all our panelists.